Ooh, it's 52 minutes. We'll at least watch some of it. Because it does look good. And I like Carl. Hello, you absolute legends. In 2017, the most expensive video game ever sold cost $30,000. It was a mint condition, sealed copy of the original the Super Mario Bros. In 2021, the, the most expensive video game ever bought cost $2 million. But this was a very special game. Oh, actually, it was the same game. That's an increase of over 6,000% for the same game in just four years. Something very strange is happening in the world of video game collecting. Headlines are flooding the internet, describing new records set for insane prices. But this is an extremely recent phenomenon, and one that seems to have arisen overnight. For the past several decades, video game collecting has honestly been pretty niche. Truly dedicated collectors seemed to be few yeah, like and angry video between, game nerd. and even if they did amass a respectable collection, there was little fame to be gathered from it. In contrast to something like the art world, where collectors represent the richest of society, flaunting their lavish purchases, video game collecting was most. Damn! Done by wait, the that looks nice. Art. Regular gamers, Holy nerds shit. in the truest sense, who were just so passionate about the hobby that they were happy to spend whatever spare cash they could scramble together to acquire a cart here or there, often as cheaply as they possibly could. Video game collectors weren't rich, but they didn't need to be either. Retro video games were never that expensive, therefore basically anyone could do it. And that was one of the great things about it. All you oh, really NFL Blitz! was passion and time. But in I wonder if any of the games I have are worth anything. happened that would change everything. The launch of a company called Water Games. This was oh, no that's fucking crazy, launch, Dyson. Okay. And Water is no ordinary company. There is a select group of very wealthy, very powerful people who are pulling the strings behind this recent spike in video game prices. And those same people are making money hand over fist. Okay, when I so someone more knowledgeable than me. Is this a new grading company? I assumed that this grading company was like 40 years old, like old as shit, grading games for a long time. But it seems like they're not that old. It's, and it's the only one? So 2018 for that one, but there has to be an older one, right? I understand he talks about it, but I'm asking, isn't there like a really old one? Or are they all newer? Okay, so VGA is the old one. Thank you. When I heard the news of a $1.5 million Super Mario 64, this seemed too ridiculous for me to Because I'd never even seen these ratings until Mizkiff. I knew there had to be more to the story than meets the eye, and boy, was I not wrong. This rabbit hole is deep. The bubble we are seeing in video games has been seen before in other collectibles for almost half a century. And the crazy thing is that each time it happens, the same people are involved. They know exactly what they are doing, and they know how to extract as much money as possible from suckers who believe the headlines. There is a lot of shady stuff going on, and you won't believe what I've found. This entire situation is fraught with unethical business practices, deception, collusion, and even fraud. By the end of this video, you will know exactly why this is happening, ninja. who is causing it to happen, and what needs to be done to stop it. I really hope you enjoy. Thank you that, Kamido. I've said for a long time I think grading is a fucking now, scam. Now, before we get into the specific details about how this entire racket works, there are some concepts that I want you to be familiar with so that you can better understand the context. The first is the difference between the intrinsic and extrinsic properties of an object and how they relate to perceived value. Intrinsic properties lie within the object itself. For example, if we were to examine a painting, the intrinsic properties would be the materials it was made of and also, of course, how the painting actually looked. That's like the, the least extrinsic important properties thing would be of a the painting. relationship the artwork had with look like shit. else. Who it was painted like by, Jackson when it was painted, the context in which it was painted, and how sought after the piece is, are all important qualities. When it comes to perceived value, it is the extrinsic qualities of a collectible that raises the cost significantly. Van Gogh paintings often sell for tens of millions of dollars. But At if least we were to program cool. a robot to paint an identical piece, it wouldn't be worth much more than the cost of the paint and the canvas. Ultimately, both pieces would look the same on our wall. But us weird and wacky humans like to care about the details that don't directly impact us. We are even willing to spend millions of dollars more than Protect we need to because of these details. 
In the 17th century, during the Dutch Golden Age, an event happened known as Tulip Mania, where the price of tulip bulbs reached insane okay, levels. At the time, tulip bulbs were a luxury item that were highly desired for their intense colors, and as their time. popularity slowly increased and over the years, I'll check the it out price later, inevitably went up. Eventually, people began noticing the trend of rising prices, and started to speculate on the market. Speculating means buying a good not due to need, but purely in the hopes that the price will increase so that you can sell it at a later date for profit. With investors beginning to flood the tulip market, this began a positive feedback loop, driving prices up even more. As the price increased Tulips faster, pretty not hardcore. wanting to miss out on the opportunity, even more people started buying in. This caused the first recorded speculative bubble in history. And there are two important things to know about these types of bubbles. First, no one buying Did actually wants neon. tulips. They just hope to Sounds make awful. money. And secondly, this process is not sustainable and eventually people stop buying and the price crashes. Those left holding tulips lose everything as their value plummets back to normal. Yeah, now, well, don't buy tulips, idiots. Because the exact same thing is happening with video games right now. But the difference is that this current video game bubble isn't an accident. You see, if you know how speculative bubbles hey, work, Beanie Babies. you can theoretically yeah. create them at will. I remember that bubble. All you would have to do is raise the perceived price of a good quick enough so that speculators see the trend and start entering the market. Then, you can just sit back and let the positive feedback loop do the work. Profiting Thanks from your watchman. artificially created bubble by buying games early and selling later is rather obvious. But there are actually smarter ways to make money. Ways that First incur gaming console I did was risk. Nintendo 64. In the current video game market and the collectible market in general, there are two institutions that stand to gain the most from increasing prices. Those are grading companies and auction houses. <laughs> grading, companies grading companies are a scam. Company is a business scam. that inspects games, Big certifies scam. them, and gives them a rating of quality. They are basically quality assurance. They allow buyers to know exactly what they are getting, which enables quick and easy transactions. In a bubble, people are flocking to get their games graded in the hopes of profiting from the increasing prices. But it's not just the extra business that helps grading companies, as they also take a percentage of the market value when grading a game. A game worth $10,000 might cost around $400 to have graded, but if that exact same game was valued at $1 million, taken a shit outside it before. would cost over $20,000 to have graded. It's a pretty good deal. But the institution that really profits the most by far is auction houses. Take Heritage Auctions for example, which is where all of the current record-breaking video game sales are taking place. They charge a 20% buyer's premium Whoa. on every sale. So if you buy a video game for $1 million, you need to pay the auction house $200,000 on top. Holy shit! And just for shits and giggles, they also take 5% from the seller as well. You can begin to see why Who would do that? and auction houses would really want prices to go up. It's in their interest. This is also why grading companies and auction houses should never be speculating on the price of goods or impacting markets directly. They Holy have a huge shit. conflict of interest. And whenever you see a grading company or an I would never house do that. talking about how I don't grade shit. Are, I don't buy graded shit on purpose or anything. I don't go to auction Again, houses to buy need graded to keep shit. All of this in mind. I'm going to provide you with a ton of information and I'm going to trust you to connect the dots. If you are really interested in learning what's going on, I suggest writing down details as we go or watching sections more than once. Let's begin. The two institutions that you will become very familiar with are Water Games, the video game grading company, and Heritage Auctions, the auction house. Water Games was founded in 2017, but it didn't officially launch until April of 2018. Water Games is the linchpin behind this entire bubble, and the certification that Water provides is the Does Water stand for something, or is it just literally Water? Prices. Interestingly, Water wasn't the first video game grading company to exist. In fact, the Video Game Authority, aka oh, VGA, does talk about has it. been grading games since 2008. But the introduction of VGA Still not that didn't old. cause a bubble like the introduction of Water Games did, and the reason is simple. VGA didn't manipulate the market or go out of their way to create Still a Still scam. Still the scam. Fuck can't rating. Be said for Water, however. The president and CEO of Water Games is Dennis Khan, and he is a key player. 
The other important company, Heritage Auctions, was founded in 1976 by like Steve Ivey records. and Jim Halperin. Our Steve album's Ivey coming out on vinyl as like a collector story, thing. But Jim, on the other hand, is critical. Heritage Auctions are in the business of selling rare collectibles and memorabilia. They sell coins, comics, art, anything you can collect that has value. And in 2019, they started selling video games. But not just any video games, only games that had been graded through Water Games. The interesting thing about the relationship between Water and Heritage is that it seems to have existed before Water even began grading games. On the initial website of Water, when it launched, it had a dealer spotlight section where it listed key relationships. One was Heritage Auctions, where it stated that Water certified video games will be Draco featured in Heritage online auctions. This doesn't make sense. The entire point of certification is to guarantee authenticity and quality, but a guarantee is worthless if you haven't established a history of accurate work. Why would Heritage Auctions, a prestigious auction house, agree to sell games from a company that hadn't graded a single game? Why would they trust a business that Dennis hadn't looks done smart. any business to begin with, when there was already an existing grading company that had been grading games for 10 years? The only explanation to me is that Heritage Auctions was involved in some way in the creation of Water Games, and knew that it was on board with their mutual goals. And if you needed any further evidence of this pre-existing relationship, Jim Halperin, the founder of Heritage Auctions, was listed on the Water website as an advisor. Another business that Water had a relationship <laughs> upon shit. creation was Just Press Play, a distributor of used video games which was founded by Zach Geig. Just Press Play also announced that it would be selling Water certified games. Now, in order to create a speculative bubble, you need a way to spread information very quickly. You need to draw in new eyes and to make potential buyers aware that a market is building. The easiest way to achieve this by far is to create headline-worthy events that can disseminate through the media. In this case, it was the purchase of a Super Mario Bros. cart for $100,000 in February of 2019. Before this sale, the previous most expensive video game ever sold went for $30,000, so this new sale was a pretty big deal, big enough to generate headlines. But the even more interesting thing is who bought this game. It was purchased Mizkif. by three men. Uh. The first was Jim Halperin, founder and chairman of Heritage Auctions. The second was Zach Geig, founder and owner of Just Press Play. The third was Richard Lecce, who has one of the largest video game collections on the planet. Heritage Auctions then issued a press release about the sale. Because of course, the purchase was never about collecting the game, it was about publicity. And if this wasn't obvious enough, Jim Halperin advertised in this press release that the game may end up in a future auction. Dennis Kahn, CEO of Water Games, also chimed in, stating, quote, Water certified video games have been selling for record prices ever since Heritage began auctioning them in January. While many video games sell regularly for five figures, breaking the six-figure mark shows that the hobby's up This is pretty deep, actually. ...indicates no signs of slowing down. So what you have here is the chairman of the auction house buying a game for a record price and then creating a press release about his own purchase in which himself and the president of the grading company are stating that the value of games is going up. He then advertises that his own game will be going up for auction in the future through his own auction house. And his plan worked. The press immediately jumped on this, and many articles about the purchase were written. Khan's tactic of pumping up the perceived value of games would be seen in every article. It looks like he has for a little example, shark fin. In a Kotaku article, Khan states, <clears throat> I've always said, video games are going to go the way of comics or cars or coins. It's only a matter of time until a video game sells for a million dollars. In an Ars Technica show. article, both Khan and Halperin were again pumping up the perceived value of games, with Halperin stating, There are bets on what will someday be the first million dollar game and many collectors believe that this will be the one. It's so strange to me that news articles allow the owner of a game to advertise that its worth is 10 times what they paid for and not a single eyebrow is raised. They did everything <laughs> they could to raise awareness about the sale. They even took the cart onto porn stars, claiming it was worth a million dollars. This appearance was the perfect opportunity to establish what a game as gym. the authority in grading, despite having only existed less than a tenth of the time that VGA had. Porn stars even had Dennis Khan come on, and again he pumped up the value, implying that it was worth at least three times. Wait, what, what the paid. fuck? Did they? Did 
did they pay Pawn Stars for this? Because he owns the company that graded this. Wouldn't that be like a massive conflict of interest there? They had to like a paid history channel, right? Like there's no way. Thanks for the five gift subs, Tyler Flint and the resub Hamby and tier one the That it was worth at least three times what they paid. Remember what I said about grading companies. Obviously, Pawn Stars isn't real, but this is very different than what they usually prices. do. Dennis even faced backlash about this from intelligent collectors who knew what he was up to. But of course, this didn't stop him. He went on Pawn Stars multiple times, valuing games at insane prices. I can give you dozens of examples, but the point is that there was a very large, very effective campaign to establish Water as the authority on video games, despite having only been created. It was critical that Water was seen as the be-all and end-all in video game grading, because then the words of its CEO, Dennis Khan, would be more effective in increasing the value of games. Khan would continue to abuse his authority as the head of Water Games for the next few years, appearing in countless articles and interviews, and always pumping up the price. In fact, he's still doing it, even with the ridiculous price of $1.5 million that the recent Super Mario 64 went for in July. In a Verge article covering the record-breaking sale, Khan states, I think that we are going to continue to see record-breaking sales. Again, this is purely to make stink? people believe the price will continue to go up in order to fuel speculation. All of this press is Gugama. driving up prices, but it's only one half of the equation. Are Mizkif's boxes water? Games, but Not the VGA? people buying these games aren't who you'd expect. If you thought they were video game collectors hoping to complete their collection, you'd be wrong. Let's take a look at who is really buying up Ms. these games. Miz has VGA. Okay. Video game collecting has taken an interesting turn in the past few years. Over the last decade or so, poo -poo. I've been a big fan of watching collectors' videos on YouTube, where they proudly show off what they've amassed. In my experience, genuine collectors love sharing their prized possessions, but that's not what we're seeing with these record-breaking sales. Nowadays, the buyers of these expensive games are hidden from the public. Identities are kept cousin. secret, and no one takes credit for anything. It's all really strange. Heritage auctions will never tell you who the buyers are, or even if money was actually exchanged. However, there are ways we can tell who bought some of the games, and this is where things get weird. Several weeks ago, I was investigating the relationship between Water Thanks Games and beard. Porn Stars. Given that the original appearance of Water on that show was obvious collusion between the grading company, the auction house, and the show. In particular, I was researching the appearance of a Mike Tyson's punch-out that Dennis Kahn valued at $80,000. Through a Google search, I found something very interesting. It was a purchase agreement of the exact same cart. The owner of the cart, Brian, had sold it to a company for the exact same amount that Dennis had valued it at. The buyer was RSE Archive, LLC, which trades as Rally. Rally is a platform that allows investors to buy and sell equity shares in collectibles. Speed. To put it simply, people can buy a fraction of a video game, and if the price goes what? up, they can sell their slice to someone else in order to make a profit. It's essentially gambling on the price of collectibles, and it's as silly That's as it so sounds. That's so dumb, None yeah. None of the people who buy equity in any of these collectibles actually own it. It's purely to try and make bets on the price and earn a quick buck. The purchase agreement I found for the Mike Tyson's Punch-Out was an SEC filing. Companies that hold these items and sell equity in them need to disclose their assets to the SEC so we can track exactly what they buy and how much for. There are three fractional share companies that have sprung up in the past several years you, Tyler, that are selling that. equity in video Thank games. Mythic Markets, Otis, and Rally. Each of them was formed immediately following the launch of Water Games. Through their SEC filings, I can track their purchases. Rally bought a Super Mario Brothers for $140,000 in 2020. This was the same cart that would eventually be sold for $2 million just this month. From Heritage, Lord. they acquired this GoldenEye for $22,800, this Grand Theft Auto for $13,200, and this Donkey Kong for $38,400. Mythic Markets also bought this Metroid for $46,800. Otis also bought a Mike Tyson's Punch-Out for 130,000. From Heritage, they bought a Pokemon Yellow for 78 grand, this Golf for 18,000, and many other private purchases. Quick question then, quick question. Uh, are people sending these games in to get graded by Wata? Or does Wata just have these on standby? Like they have these in stock and they sell them through Heritage? Hey Pluto. 
It is fraud. Yeah, this is absolutely fraud. Okay, so people are sending them in. So they're sending them in, they get graded, and then those people take them to the auction where they get exploited and fisted, right? For 20% plus an additional 5% of the sale. Okay. Oh, that's got to be rough to see then, Pluto. Uh -oh. Aside from these fractional share companies, we can also see people buying games from Heritage and trying to flip them on eBay. For example, a Super Mario that was bought for 84000 in, in September of 2020 is now sitting on eBay with an asking price of $1.5 I haven't heard of a single legitimate collector buying any of these expensive games. It's entirely speculation, purely for profit. But there have been attempts to fool the public into believing that actual collectors are buying these games. And one of the biggest cheerleaders for this fake narrative is Eric Nyerman. In 2019, a slew of articles sprung up about a video game collecting dentist who bought a million dollars worth of video games. The original article was posted by the Washington Post, but if you know the real story, this article is insane. It describes Eric Nyerman as one of the world's most avid video game collectors, but in reality, he had only been collecting for several months. He began only in 2019 at the beginning of this bubble. There are many people who have been collecting games their entire lives, but this man comes along and he's instantly the most avid collector in the entire world. Well, he does the look like claims it. that he bought the he games, means business. but this is also not true. He wasn't even using his own money. The money was put up by a group of investors, not by Eric Nyerman. The article becomes even more suspicious when Dennis Khan again rears his head to hype up the market. Heritage Auctions also shows up advertising that the market is increasing. Eric makes his intentions clear by stating his opinion that video games should be selling for millions, which of course would benefit him greatly after his purchase. So why is the Washington Post and many other news outlets touting Eric, who only entered the video game market in 2019, as the forefront of collecting? Why is it falsely stating that he Who's bought the, the game when it was actually an investment hedge fund? Why are Water Games and Heritage Auctions always there to give their opinion on the market? It's because they own the government. It's not news, it's propaganda. <gasps> Eric Nyman is part of the small group of people at the very top, building this bubble in an attempt to make money. He is a talking head with one purpose, to trick people into believing the video games he owns are worth millions, which he will then sell. He can be seen alongside people like Dennis Khan, always attempting to inflate the market. And this isn't a secret, he admits his intentions freely. Of course, that same week I discover on Heritage Auctions vintage video games, which I never knew, even knew existed. And then when I like, when it played through in my head, I'm like, oh my God, this is like so much better than cards and my, for me. I mean, also it was a new and emerging market. Like you guys are having with NFTs. It's that excitement of like- They're doing wow, NFTs now? This even catches up a quarter of to where cards have gone. You know, we, we could we could see 100x returns just at the beginning, you know, because it was so new. But as a, as, a, as a collectible investment, this was like everything that I was, I saw on a Mike Trout card, but like to the max on steroids. And for me, it was a time machine. It was literally like, if you if you could like sh I always said to myself I would look at like Nat Turner's collection on of of cards on Instagram at that time and I was like wow if only I could go back 10 years and just like hang out with him and just buy everything he was buying and you know it's that time machine that everyone has Has anyone ever made a living buying and selling and video games that, right? like collector so games said, This is my moment that I'm going to go back in time but it's going to be today and I'm an individual just that go is for it. so we we set up we we spent time we set up an llc we 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 made a business plan um and i went to like just neighbors so a couple of mine, people family friends all like successful wealthy people uh, we, we we spoke about all the risks game the stop up front. they knew it was speculative and i'm like listen yeah. like, but they all said the same thing they're like you seem super passionate about it if i lose 15 grand on you it's not the end of the world give it a run to show even on heritage auctions ebay auctions look we already what we spent appreciated 20 to 30 percent this is working i'm gonna get out there and i'm gonna i'm gonna help make the market i'm gonna let people know about this i'm forming a market of, of around something that i feel that is severely underappreciated um so that's what i was doing my point is that it's not collectors that are buying any of these games it's purely people with a lot of money. Damn, he looks like a villain. People out of theirs by he was mean mugging. A bubble that otherwise shouldn't exist. Propaganda isn't their only weapon either. 
it gets much worse. We will now enter the wonderful world of shill bidding. Oh shit. Baseball cards. When it comes to auctions, there is only one thing that will consistently drive up the sale price of goods, and that one thing is competition. Obviously, if there is only Please one bidder, the price will never go up. You are not going to bid more if you already have the top bid, but if two or more people are duking it out, that's where the price can really shoot up. Shield bidding is the act of placing fake bids in the attempt to raise the price. Usually this is done in collusion with the seller, because the seller wants to make more money for the item they are selling. So they will work with a third party, who will keep placing fake bids up to an agreed price, at which point they will concede and let the victim win the item. But it isn't just sellers that have motive for this kind of practice. The auction house itself has just as much to gain from inflated sale prices. If your auction house sells goods at higher prices than your competitors, people will want to sell their items through your auctions. And this is where we come back to Heritage Auctions. In 2008, a lawsuit was filed against Heritage Auctions for shill bidding. It was filed by Gary Hendershot, who was a former employee. The lawsuit alleged that Heritage used a shill bidder by the name of N.P. Gresham to drive up prices. That's a cool this name. This lawsuit was ultimately really settled cool out name. of court, so you may or may not want to put any real stock in it, but it is something to take notice of. Especially when Jim Halperin, one of the defendants, and if you remember, one of the investors who bought the record-breaking Super Mario, was caught lying in a sworn testimony. He originally claimed that M.P. Gresham didn't exist at all, but later had to admit they in fact did. If this lawsuit was the only claim of shill bidding, <clears throat> I might be less inclined to believe it. But the story doesn't end there. While I was researching for this video, I spoke at length with Pat the NES Punk, who is one of the most dedicated collectors of NES games I've actually heard of this been. guy before. He told me he was contacted by a comic book collector and seller whose father not only worked at Heritage Auctions, but was also friends with Jim Halperin. What he had to say was shocking, and Pat graciously connected us so we could talk. The collector, David Wilson, who founded and runs Collectors Comics, told me this. Hi, my name is David. I'm from hey, David. Uh, Comic Book Investments um, on YouTube. My dad, uh, big time comic book dealer in the 80s and 90s, uh, he ended up taking a job with Heritage a couple hey, of Connor, years ago. Hey, Connor, of course, man. And he had a personal relationship with Jim, and they had a personal relationship hey, for surfing. years. And then through the relationship, that's how he got a job working at Heritage. He was a comic book grader. He worked for Heritage for almost two years. And during that time at Heritage, he had a few conversations with Jim. He told, my dad told me, because I would talk about the video games, I was like, hey, dad, I can't believe the video game sold for so much. He was already gone by the time the video games have reached where they are at now. And he told me, he's like, yeah, so they're manipulating the market. And my dad gave me an example. Jim is one of the biggest comic collectors in the world. He has one of the biggest collections in the world. Is he Jake this Paul's huge. fighting next? And what no. Jim does... And is it a child this time? Said, he would take a comic book. Let's say he would take this book, right? He put it in his collection. And then like three, four years later, he'd throw it up on Heritage. And is there some, hey, then Josh, he would manipulate the, the price the by reset. bidding it up. So say he bought sure, the book man, for I can three check. grand forever ago. He throws, he throws it in a Heritage auction. And then he bid it up to, say, like five grand, six grand. Buy it from himself, basically. He bids it up. And then he sticks it away back in his collection. And then every couple of years later, three, four, five years later, whatever it is, makes its way back into the heritage auction, does it again. And what that does is it stimulates the market by pushing it up, propping it up higher than it is to show like, hey, there's been a sale of this comic book or video game for this price. So that means it must be worth that much. And that's nice. I, okay. That's that kind of cool. like what I have a feeling that they're doing with video games. They're propping them up like super high, higher than they should be to create a market, manipulate the market into thinking that these video games are actually worth Z. this much because they have sales data to prove it. Has Heritage come if out with this a statement? Is true, this video is three days I old. I know about Jim Halperin leads me to believe it probably is. The tactic definitely works. When items are sold at higher prices, it raises the perceived value of every similar item. It's even more effective if you purchase items at record prices. Every time a video game sells higher than ever before, the internet is flooded with articles advertising your auction house. For over two years, all we ever heard about was all of the insane prices that games were going for on Heritage Auctions. Naturally, this makes people want to sell their games through Heritage as opposed to anywhere else.
But with all of the reports of shill bidding, reports of buying their own items, and the intense secrecy of purchases, we don't know if Heritage were involved subsisty. in any of these record-breaking sales. This is why we also can't be sure of the recent $2 million purchase from Rally, as again, the ridiculous price, the secrecy, and the obvious motive make it very suspicious. Well, I think Jim it can Alperin be said with a high level of certainty that this is a fucking scam. <laughs> own platform to it's like literal benefit. fraud. It's time to take a closer Alleged look at what a game and how some of the key figures in that business are using their positions for their own gain. Shill bidding and buying your own items at inflated prices are pretty obvious ways to abuse your position at an There's auction house. But how could you take advantage of your own grading company? The first thing that comes to mind would be grading your own games. This presents a pretty clear conflict of interest, and even Watta admits this. In a New York Times article, Watta president Dennis Kahn goes on record to say that Watta employees are not allowed to have games graded by the company, or sell those that were. I'll say that again. Water employees are not allowed to have games graded by the company or sell those that were. I this imagine they sense, still do. And I applaud that rule if it's actually upheld. Now let's take a look at a transaction that occurred in 2019 between two gentlemen. The first is Dane Anderson. Dane is the founder of Nintendo Age, which hosted the largest community of retro video Maybe game some collectors retro Tyler. and enthusiasts on the internet. It also contained the most valuable database of information concerning retro games and what they were worth. Thanks, retro. If you wanted to know anything about collecting, this Congrats. would be your first place to go. Dane was also well known for his video game collection, and he had one of the largest assortments of sealed Nintendo games on the planet. But in 2019, he sold his entire collection to a gentleman by the name of Jeff Meyer, who is the Jeff. founder and CEO of GoCollect, which is a price guide for comic books. The purchase of Dane's collection by Jeff was a pretty big deal, one of the biggest in history. It was so noteworthy that What a Games even gave the collection a special name. It was called the Carolina Collection, because both men hailed Maybe from Carolina. Some Jeff submitted the games to Wata, who graded them all, and as part of that grading, inserted the name of the collection they were a part of. And you can see this name on the label of the graded games. Jeff then immediately took the newly graded games and started flipping them through auction houses, most notably Heritage Auctions, where the first auction alone produced a total return wow. of over half a million dollars. So what? why am I telling you this? Well, it's because Jeff Meyer is a director of Water Games. You won't find this information publicly because they keep it a secret, but thankfully the company's SEC filings tell us everything we need to know. According to their own filings, Jeff Meyer is a director of the company. So what you have is the president of Water Games saying that employees well? are not allowed to grade or sell graded games, but meanwhile, a director of the company is grading his entire collection. But not just grading it, grading it in a special, privileged way by naming it, therefore increasing the value, and immediately selling them through auction houses at insane prices for profit. If the games in this collection were graded just like any other game, there would be nothing illegal about this. However, considering the fact that they were graded in a unique and special way, there is a very good argument to be made here for fraud, especially given that Jeff's relationship with Water Games was never disclosed to the public. But it gets even worse. <laughs> Jeff Meyer also purchased Nintendo Age, which as I mentioned was the most valuable data This is very for big brain. Games. Jeff immediately shut it down. He also purchased the website Game Value Now, which is a price guide for video game sales. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but on the surface, it appears as though Jeff is trying to own and control the flow of information about the value of video games, which only ends up being more suspicious given his ties to Water Games. Again, another huge conflict of interest. Jeff has never publicly admitted to being a part of Water Games, and the way he talks about his relationship with Wata makes it seem like that's intentional. For example, in a blog post he wrote himself about his upcoming video game price guide, Jeff states, Thanks to the great relationships with the awesome folks at Water Games, he is talking in the third person about a company that he is a director of. The cherry on top of all of this is that when Water Games was incorporated in 2017, Dane Anderson was the executive officer. So this entire deal happened between two men that were or Holy are shit. directly involved with the company. What the Dennis fuck? Khan obviously knows who the directors of his company are, so it really makes you think when he blogs about the Carolina collection on the Water Games website, but fails to disclose that the purchaser of the collection is a director. 
and it forces you to think even harder when you realize that at the very same time he is telling the New York Times that employees cannot grade or Surely sell. one of these people have talked about this, right? Jeff Meyer. He has a YouTube channel, right? Surely he's talked about this. What's his YouTube channel? I'm having a hard time finding it. I really want to hear what they have to say. Because this seems pretty ironclad. Thank you for the thousand bits, Fada fan. Hope you're doing well. Someone said that Wada Games is going after Carl for this video. Carl is always getting targeted by the weirdest people. Like fucking Billy Mitchell. And now Wada Games. Oh, here we go. Jeff Meyer's statement. No one- here, I'll put it on screen. Oh, actually, this is dangerous. This is Twitter. Might see the council of cock. Jeff Meyer's statement. No one at GoCollect, myself included, was consulted on any of this content. The allegations against me and GoCollect are untrue. I was never employed by Wata. I held a board position because I was a late stage investor in the company, and I resigned from my board position in January 2020. I would welcome a live stream interview with Carl Jobst. My and then Carl responds. My point here seems to be missed. I never called Jeff Meyer an employee. My point is that being a director is worse than being an employee because you have stake, control, and ownership of the company, which was never disclosed to the public. Yeah, I mean, that, like, that sounds, like, so irrefutable. Like, how do you even go against that? Because he was an active director of the company... Like, it's, it's, like, what do you, like, what do you even say? Like, no. Fuck you. Your dick's small. You're wrong. Uh, like, like, what do you do? Like, you can't do anything. He is literally a director who bought the collection from another direct, well, I don't, I actually don't remember if the Dane was a director, but he was there when the company was fucking formed. So he bought the collection from another higher up at the company, had it graded by the company he's a director of, and then sold it to the auction house the company works with. Like, how, like, there's just no way of defending that. He's a tier one atomic. And God knows those grades were inflated. I guarantee half that shit is not like a nine. What a wild the rabbit hole. What are graded games? There is a good reason why grading your own games is a big conflict of interest, as the grade is extremely relevant when it comes to how much a game can be sold the for. Bits chunky. The higher the grade, the more valuable a game will be. There is no better example than the recent sale of Super Mario 64 for 1.5 million on Heritage Auctions. Its grade was a 9.8, with an A++ for the seal. It's essentially the highest <clears throat> grading a game could ever hope to achieve. On the same day, another Super Mario 64 was auctioned with an 8.5 rating that sold for only $31,000. That's an increase of 5,000% for a slightly higher grading. This raises another interesting question. How reliable are these ratings? If you are going to spend $1.5 million for a high rating, you'd want to be pretty damn sure that the rating is accurate. Grading companies attempt to make their grading process as objective as possible, but the truth is that they are very subjective by nature. At the end of the day, the grading is given by a human based on their own perception of the game's quality, and history has shown that this perception can vary wildly from person to person. Grading companies have been known to give very different grades for the exact same item, and this has led to a practice called regrading. If someone receives a grade for an item that they believe is not high enough, they will simply take it out of the case and send it back. You have a lot of people playing what I call the crack out game, meaning they get a comic book back and it comes back CGC 9.6. They think it should be a 9.8. So they crack that baby open and they keep sending it back to CGC, hoping that at some point that grader is either going to slip up or that grader is going to get that book and go, hey, you know what? This is a 9.8. They're going to slap 9.8 on it and they're going to send it back to that submitter and that submitter is going to be very happy because in the overall marketplace for certain books you go from a 9.6 to a 9.8 you just made a large chunk of money the average collector God the damn. average speculator and the average investor such a scam is overvaluing a lot of these items based on the grade not realizing that in certain instances the grade is arbitrary. It is an estimation. It is not an exact science. 
but you don't even need to regrade games in order to see the blatant inconsistency on display with what are graded games. Last month, a Tomb Raider for the Sega Saturn was sold for $12,000 through Heritage Auctions. It had a rating of 9.8 with an A plus for the seal, but it's I'm immediately right. obvious that this grading makes no sense. The seal has multiple very large <gasps> holes, which according to the grading system on Wata's own website is not allowed for A-plus seals, which must contain no holes. The seal also has countless smaller holes, scratches, and stains. Quite frankly, it looks disgusting, and yet it gets an A-plus. I've seen seals uh, with B-grade that are better quality than this. My point is that video game grading is not a science, and the ratings given to games are not an exact representation of the game's quality. And yet, the rating is touted as the sole justification God, a crypto for why punk people are spending an pick. extra million dollars on Holy some of these fuck. games. Now you understand why it is so important to establish Wata as the utmost authority on video games, because it makes their ratings all the more valuable. Now, one final thing before we move on. If you knew you were about to create a bubble surrounding sealed video games, what would you do? Personally, I would start buying as many sealed video games as I could. This is Mark Haspel, one of the founders of Water Games and the current chief advisor. He has been involved in the comic book collecting scene for decades, but was never active in video game collecting. But right around the time that Wata was formed, he suddenly started showing up at video game conventions, buying as many sealed games as he could. Not only that, but he would actively seek out and inquire about sealed NES games. More specifically, the popular ones such as Mario, Metroid, Mega Man, Castlevania, and Zelda. The kind of games we see being sold now for record But prices. what about Tomb Raider? And remember, this was several years ago. His taste in video games seemed to align perfectly with the same games that would bring the most profit several years later. Thoughts on CryptoPunks? Dumbest stated, shit I've ever Mark seen in Haspel my life. was buying sealed six packs from a good friend of mine a year before Wata started grading games. Pat the NES Punk also noticed Haspel collecting games at conventions. In June 2019, I was a guest at a gaming convention. The weekend of Thanks the event, Chile. I noticed a small group of individuals who were hurriedly acquiring the sealed Wolper. and complete in box games from vendors. At one point, I witnessed an individual who I later learned to be Mark Haspel returning to the WADA Expo booth while holding a stack of NES games. I did find it a little strange, but was unaware of any affiliation that person may have had with WADA, so I didn't think much of it at the time. It's obviously not illegal for the founders of Water Games to collect video games, and it's impossible to prove intent, but these examples just strengthen my opinion that they knew what was about to happen, and they were preparing for it. Now, before we get to the conclusion, I want to teach you about an event in history that might be relevant to what's happening right now. The great coin collecting bubble of the 80s. Oh, yeah, but the coin collecting shit was wild. Believe it or not, this kind of crazy bubble surrounding a collectible has been seen <clears> before. <throat> Not to this extent, but still, this isn't a new thing. In the 80s, it wasn't video games, it was coins. PCGS is the world leader in coin grading, and on its website it tracks something called the PCGS 3000 Index. It's an index of the value of coins, similar to something like the Dow Jones. In the historical chart, you can see a massive spike occurring in the late 80s. After crashing, the price has still not recovered to levels seen 30 years ago, and this is without even considering inflation. So what caused this bubble? Well, according to an article posted on AntiquesAge.com, it was the development of slabbing and the introduction of third-party certification. Slabbing is where a grading company will take a coin, encase it in plastic, and give it a rating. Two grading companies were formed around this time, PCGS and NGC. The article goes on to state that the arrival of PCGS and NGC changed the industry nearly overnight. Now dealers, collectors, and investors could buy or sell slabbed coins sight unseen, because they all trusted the grades given by the major grading services. If you're beginning to get a sense of deja vu, that's completely understandable. This is literally the exact whoa. same thing whoa, whoa, that's whoa, currently whoa. happening with video Are games. 50 the gift fact subs that could easily and Thank you, man. God damn. purchase graded coins meant that they began to sell more and more. Thank you for the big this generosity. This led to the price going up. Investors began to That's take a notice, right and more there. importantly, you, even investment hedge funds got involved. 
Kidder, Peabody & Co, Merrill Lynch, and UBS all created coin hedge funds where they took in money from investors to invest in coins. This expanded the bubble even further. But the thing about speculative bubbles is that they always burst. The price cannot go up forever, and at the slightest hint that the peak has been reached, everyone sells. The ironic thing you need to remember is that people who buy collectibles in order to make money never actually intend to collect or keep them. So when the price starts to drop, everyone is attempts to necrosis? liquidate their assets as quickly as possible in order to not lose money. The market becomes flooded, but because no one is buying, the price gets destroyed. In the end, it's the suckers that came in late that lose them. It's extremely ironic that Charlie spends hundreds of thousands on his card packs, but thinks crypto punks are stupid. Hundreds of thousands? Are you insane? No, crypto punks are stupid. It's literal fucking RNG generated pixels. Like, I think it's like, what is it, 8-bit? It's like an 8-bit smoking man, and it sells for 180 grand. CryptoPunks are super dumb. NFTs are super stupid. I mean, you can keep spending thousands of dollars on a picture of a tweet, but objectively, cards are cooler. And I'm not buying the cards to sell them. I'm buying them because they look cool. CryptoPunks don't look cool. Plus, I can have all of the CryptoPunks in the world right now on my desktop. I can just download them. I just don't have them on the blockchain. NFTs are a conceptually dumb fucking thing. Uh, the, te the technology behind it's pretty impressive, but holding an NFT of Charlie Bit My Finger is useless. I have that video. Anyone can have that video. Just because you have the blockchain certified one doesn't make it any like more special. It's fucking dumb. It is an objectively stupider thing. You cannot have my physical card because I have it. It's super, super different. Like it can't even be compared. Money. The bursting of the 80s coin bubble was a big deal, and hedge funds were inundated and crypto with punks are really fucking lost dumb. their investments. It's Merrill just Lynch for rich YouTubers to peddle. Twenty million dollars to their investors. The FTC even stepped in to investigate what happened, and this is where things get juicy. In the Antiques Age article I referenced, it said that PCGS and NGC were the first third-party coin grading companies, but this is actually false. The first third-party coin grading company was NCI, Numismatic Certification Institute, which was founded in 1984. Text message. After an investigation, the FTC ruled that NCI misled customers about the value of coins. I want to read from an LA Times article written in 1989, and I want you to appreciate how amazingly relevant it is today, despite being 32 years old. The article reads, By and large, it's grading and rarity that determine the value of a coin. Rarity is easy enough to establish. Grading is often a matter of opinion. It's for this reason that grading services came into being. Their purpose is to give an impartial rating to a coin, which virtually establishes a particular price. But what happens if the grading service misrepresents the grade of a coin, thereby increasing its value? That's then a the miracle is described happening. by Bill McAllister of the Washington Post in regards to a recent decision by the Federal Trade Commission. The commission determined that overgrading coins was a deceptive and unfair act, prohibited by the 1914 law that created the FTC. Charged with this practice were two Texas-based corporations, Heritage Capital Corp oh, and shit. Numismatic Certification Institute. Uh -oh. Also named in the action were Steve Ivey and James Halperin, prominent numismatic figures. A consent order was signed agreeing to establish a $1.2 million fund for collectors who purchased the NCI-graded coins from Coin Galleries Incorporated of Miami. Heritage. Halperin. Those names sound familiar. No, it's no, that's a coincidence. And Jim Halperin. No, In no, the no, 80s, no. they were Different found guy. guilty of illegally misleading customers about the value of coins and fined $1.2 million. From the 1989 FTC annual report, it states... Numismatic Certification Institute and its principals Steve Ivey and James Halperin agreed to settle charges that its representations and failures to disclose information misled customers to the value of coins certified by the company. An affiliate, Heritage Senpai Capital Corporation, mix. also agreed to settle charges that it provided substantial assistance to a coin retailer, certified rare coin galleries, knowing that CRCG was misrepresenting the security and profit potential of its coins to investors. Under the settlement, defendants agreed to a permanent injunction, and Heritage and NCI agreed to contribute $1.2 into a consumer redress plan for CRCG's customers. 
Another interesting thing about Jim is that in 1985 he wrote a book called How to Grade What US a great points, book it was, up there with the Bible. The grading standards of the two leading third-party grading services, Thanks, PCGS and NGC, were ultimately based. Again, these are the two grading companies that Antiques Age cited as use. the most important factors in the coin bubble. Purpose. There is a, a very strong doesn't. case to be made that Jim Halperin is the single most responsible person for the coin bubble of the 80s. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it kind of looks like he's doing exactly the same thing again 40 years later, but this time in video games. As I've said before, it's impossible to prove intent, but one thing you can certainly disprove is ignorance. Jim Halperin was extremely caught up in the 80s coin bubble and was so responsible that he was fined over a million dollars. You don't forget something like that. He knows exactly how bubbles are formed. He's seen them before, which is why he would know exactly how to one? create them again. None Remember, gang? Jim Halperin bought the Super Mario Bros. cart that sparked this entire game bubble. He is an advisor to Water Games and according to rumors, also an investor in the company. He is the founder of the auction house that these games have been selling on for record prices. It's too convenient that this one person is involved in every single piece of the puzzle when he has It's just a coincidence. He loves games, he bro. He's a gamer. This doesn't seem like a coincidence. And he to can me. value them. The retro video game Jim bubble wouldn't fuck cannot us. go on forever. At some point, it will burst. The question is when. There are a couple of scenarios that might <clears> make this happen sooner rather than later. The first is the release of population reports. In collecting, one of the things that drives up the price of is an there item no pop is reports rarity. for water? In every other realm of collecting, grading companies produce what are what called population reports. These reports tell you exactly how many of any particular <clears throat> item have been graded by the company, along with their rating. So if I do a search for Action Comics number one through CGC, a comic book grader, I can find out exactly how many are out there and at what rating. Population reports are standard practice because they allow people to judge the rarity of what an item What if Nintendo's in on this fraud too? Nintendo purchases. doesn't know what the internet is, but I'm not surprise, worried about surprise, that. Surprise, what a games keeps this information hidden from the public and refuses to let anyone know how many games of each type have been graded. So we really have no idea how many of each game are out there. When more games of the same kind become known, prices plummet. It has already started happening with some games. The best example is Spider-Man for the Atari 2600. Who would buy this? In 2020, the first sealed Spider-Man was listed on Heritage Auctions. It was a 9.8 A++, the best rating you can get. It was mint condition, and it's such an old game that it's surely rare. It sold for $9,000, which in 2020 was actually still a decent amount of money to spend on a video game. But the funny thing about Spider-Man for the Atari 2600 is that it's not rare. It's not rare at all, even in mint condition. After this sale, Heritage Whoa. was flooded with 9.8 A++ Spider-Man. <laughs> and when I say flooded, I really do mean flooded. With each sale, the price diminished. In April of 2021, a 9.8 A++ sold for $870. That's a decrease of over 90% in less than a single year. When people realize how common some of these games are, prices will be destroyed. And that's what Water Games and Heritage Auctions are afraid of. Legitimate collectors have been complaining for the past two years, but unfortunately, none of them have substantial audiences that and they are essentially them look powerless so nice. against the forces that are driving this bubble. If you want to help make a positive change, what the mask is you can send Water Games some feedback by email, letting them know how appreciated it would be if they let us know how many graded games are out there. The release of population reports would be a good start, but Water Games and Heritage Auctions it also is called need to Majora's Mask? I thought the it was the Fierce Theory. Oh, no, it's not. It's a totally Journalists different mask. Journalists don't even bother asking real collectors what they think about what's happening. They simply get sound bites from Water and Heritage and allow them to inflate the bubble with hype, despite the obvious conflict of interest. I asked a couple of lifetime collectors what they think should happen, and this is what they had to say. My name is Pat Contry. I'm a YouTuber, hey, podcaster, but also a longtime video game collector since the late 90s. I've seen a lot of things in the game. Thanks, Reese. Underestimated. What's happening right now? Haven't watched the yet. Exorian. Sealed games market is something I could yeah, never, watched yet, casual. ever imagine, and it's a shame that the video game collecting hobby that I've been a part of for decades and many others, including 
uh, sellers as well, people that have helped grow this hobby of ours with passion, with knowledge, doing research, putting in the time and effort. This is the end result. The unfortunate end result is that this hobby that we all love has been perverted into something beautiful to the big ends dollars of a small group of people to line their pockets. These are rich people getting richer and they've stepped on and stepped over all the video game collectors, all the people that have sold the games, run video game shops, all the people on forums researching this illustrious uh, and beautiful past history of video games. They've all been used. We've all been used now for the selection. And it feels good. To get richer. And it's a crying shame. Oh. It's probably too late, unfortunately. But in a perfect world, there should be full transparency and accountability when it comes to these video games. We should know if someone who helps run the auction house is involved in the buying and selling of the games that this are This background being music is so nice. We should know if the people grading the games are buying and selling these games themselves. It's unethical if they are doing so, and we should know that so we can stamp out bad behavior. Now, how can this be avoided? Well, it's quite simple. If WADA would release and update population reports for all these items that they're grading on a regular basis, this would not be a problem going forward, guys. This is a problem due to the fact that there is a lack of ethics and a lack of transparency in these markets. Collectors deserve... Well, there's also a bigger problem of fraud. Out there that want this to be a thing, rather than thinking from the standpoint that you're going to make money over the long term in this market, what you should be doing is demanding better from grading companies, from auction companies, from other players in the trade. You should be demanding ethics and transparency. This bubble isn't just affecting sealed video games at the highest price points. The selling point of every single game has increased dramatically over the past two years, even for non-sealed games. Aspiring video game collectors who legitimately want well, to build their collections ketchup. will get screwed Wishing because the, the hobby will become too expensive to be viable. What's worse is that people are using the record sale prices in order to scam people. You can find cart-only Super Mario wow. 64s for hundreds or even thousands of dollars on eBay when they cart. are only worth 10 bucks. People with a lot of money and power have taken over collecting and their thirst for money means we will all suffer. As someone who does care deeply about gaming, it honestly sickens me that these people have turned these cherished possessions into a means to gamble and speculate. And I hope this ridiculous practice of trying to extract profit from the suckers who buy the hype will end sooner rather than later. As a sign of appreciation, it would be amazing if you could go and subscribe to a couple of real collectors that helped me learn more about this. Go check out Pat the NES Punk and also Sean from Reserved Investments. These two gentlemen have been collecting for most of their lives, and we need more people like this who are not only passionate Wait, but he has to water graded shit. About what's happening. Also check out David Wilson's channel as it really took some balls to be willing to let me know what he had heard. You can find the links to these channels in the description. Hopefully, you have learned something about how those in power can create speculative bubbles. Next time you see them trying to do it, make sure you call it out and let them know that we won't tolerate it. As always, thank you so much for watching. That was very Legends. interesting. That was I a lot deeper than I thought it would be. Day, and I will see you in the next video. That's fucking wild. There's a, it really seems like irrefutable proof that Carl had here. I don't know how Jim especially has any leg to stand on with all of this being so publicly visible. Like, there's no opinion pieces in this entire video. It is actual just facts and proof to back it up. Thanks for the gift sub, Yo-Yo Master. Has Jim said anything? What's his name? Jim Hal Halperin? Halperin? Oh, man. He, he's got a real goofy picture. Uh, He has a Twitter. All he does is say, just go to Heritage Heritage Auction. Those are his only tweets. He says that four times. Thanks the Prime Carter and the Reset Nasty. To be honest, I disagree with the video. <laughs> disagree with what? He proved the connection with Heritage and WADA and the very fraudulent...
activity. I don't, it's not really something you can disagree with. It's more like I, I, I just don't care, which is, which is fine. You can't disagree with like a, like a fact. <laughs> 